Europe, uh, Eastern Europe uh, region for Hyatt. Um, and we have Luc uh, Gevren, who is chief top line officer of Accor Eastern Europe. And so everybody is a specialist in the CEE region, and we're going to have a discussion um, on uh, what's happening uh, today after the, 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 the COVID-19 crisis is over. So Thomas, let me hand over the screen uh, to you. Uh, I believe you've made a, a wonderful presentation for us. It'll take a few minutes and it will form the basis for our discussions uh, in this next upcoming hour. Thomas, the screen is yours. Thank you very much, Dirk. Marina, do you want me to share my screen or will we tab through? Well, we can just move on. You just can tell me next and I'll, I'll move with the presentation. Will do. Thank you very much. Um, well, good morning, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much, Dirk, for the introduction. Thank you, Marina, for the overview of the performance situation. Uh, across uh, across Central and Eastern Europe, and a few weeks uh, or months even now about COVID nineteen, and the word I keep using when I'm when I'm discussing this is unprecedented, and it really is for the the hotel industry. This is a completely unprecedented situation. We've never seen. Do Declines are severe, we've never seen declines as sharp, and we've never seen declines as geographically widespread as we have with this virus. So if we just move on to the, the, the next slide, please. Perhaps there's a bit of a delay. There we go. So, so showing the rolling seven days to the 5th of April, which is the latest data we have available at this point in time. More recent data will be released later today. But this shows you effectively that the world has caught coronavirus from a hotel perspective. You can see that there are declines to the bottom of that one. But if we ignore the Philippines, basically market on the planet. And as we, as we see, the, the darkness of the red indicates how severe the declines are. So very, very significant across Europe, South America, South Africa. Well, so the positive though, of course, is that the only way now is And that's moving in the not too distant future. So, if we can advance. The Dylan slides. There we go. Um, so, this showcases now China, the US, and Europe from an absolute occupancy perspective for the past couple of months. And what we can see here, if we look at China, this is where we're seeing, starting to see some period of time where we had occupancies of around 10% moving up uh, to around 30%. So as China has started to increase, unfortunately, the rest of the world really is, is decreased. US and China, uh, sorry, the US and Europe have decreased over the past, really the past four weeks or so. And the US now is hovering around 7% occupancy um, for that last, that last week. So really, very, very challenging because this is this is a path that, that Europe will follow in due course. We saw approximately 40% of the hotels that were providing data to STR closed. 
now we have over 80% of them open in the vast majority of markets. So we are starting to see those hotels start to reopen. And of course, that is something that we will see in Europe, in the US, when containment does occur. Of course, it is worth thinking about, and I'm sure this is something that will come up in the discussion as well, China is a market that has a very strong domestic demand base. And that is what is driving this recovery at the moment, of course. If we think about Europe, if we think about Central and East, the same level, which is something that we need to be cognizant of as we move into a recovery period. But the good news is we are starting to see those green shoots in China. So if we can move forward now, please. Marina. Can you see the Russia and the CIS. And this shows you at, yes, so I'm seeing the next slide, so yes. Yeah. Um, this is Central and Eastern Europe, excluding Russia and the CIS. And this is a chart that we have produced for many markets, and it shows the confirmed cases of COVID-19 versus the actual level of occupancy. And we can see across Central and Eastern Europe, before the, the, the lockdowns came into place, we started to see some declines taking place anyway. Obviously, other markets in Europe were already affected. Italy, Spain, France were starting to see a number of cases. So as occupancy was starting to fall, when the lockdown was put in place, you can see, as with every other market that is under that kind of lockdown, we then see occupancies effectively bottoming out and flatlining. And that's certainly the case across Central and Eastern Europe. You can see occupancies below the 10% mark now for the last few weeks. So um, please, can you advance the slide there, Marina? Because of course, when occupancy is impacted, RevPAR is as well. Now, whilst of course rates haven't fallen, to the same percentage as you would expect uh, occupancy to have done. Obviously, RevPAR is impacted greatly. And as we, we can see on this chart now, we've seen roughly three, nearly four weeks of RevPAR declines across the region of north of 90%. So very challenging. If we can move forward, please, for, to the next slide. And this slide will show you how things are moving on a country by country basis. And this again is occupancy percentage change. And we've looked here at the last, at the last five weeks up until the, the, the week ending the 5th of April. And we can draw some, some, some stories from this, some conclusions. Effectively, the, the bottoming out of the market really happened the week of the 16th of March. That's when we, we, we flatlined as such, and that is where we have remained, uh, albeit getting slightly, slightly worse, we are affected pretty much to a similar level, 80% decline, as mentioned, from an occupancy perspective. But the closures are also starting to come. The sample is no longer possible at this point in time. So we are starting to see those closures coming through in, in the, the data there as well. And then I think the final thing to note is Russia. Obviously, uh, the I uh, in October, and Russia was a bit later to the party, shall we say? Obviously, not a party you want an invite to, but it was a bit later to the party than the other countries. Certainly, in the media, initially there didn't seem to be as as much of a, a concern around co coronavirus and its impact across Russia, but we have seen that change over the last couple of weeks. Of course, as well, Russia, strong domestic demand, just like China. So that helped, I think, hotels perform a little bit better initially at the outset of the crisis, but now very much in line with the other markets in Russia. The week ending the 5th of April saw occupancy declines of 89%. Mm -hmm. If we can just move forward now, please, uh, Marina, to some of the key cities across the region. And again, no surprises here, but just showing these numbers, uh, when you see them alive per se, it, it really is quite stark and, and simply unthinkable just a few short weeks ago. And then to, to move forward, please, to the, the uh, penultimate slide, which is 
showing you by class. But ultimately, it doesn't matter what class of hotel you are, a very little difference in how the classes have been performing uh, as we have gone into this downturn. Interestingly, when you look at the States and when you look at China, throughout this crisis, actually mid-scale and economy hotels have been holding up a bit better than we have seen at the top end of the market. But across Central and Eastern Europe, that has not been the case. So unfortunately, regardless of the class of property. So that brings me uh, to the end um, of, the, of the presentation, which hopefully has helped to, to set the scene. And it really is obviously a scene of, 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 of doom and gloom and quite unprecedented uh, data and statistics for the hospitality industry. Um, so I'll now pass back to Dirk, who hopefully will, uh, with some, some humor over the next hour, maybe we can get a smile back on people's faces having seen that, uh, that, that rather sobering picture. So thank you very much, and uh, Dirk, back to you. Thank you very much, Sir Thomas. I immediately have a question for you. Um, obviously, these 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 numbers. I mean, as as you said in 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 the beginning of your of your presentation, it's unprecedented. But what what we're seeing here, so it's a total. Basically, everything is is to zero. But in China, we're seeing things picking up, and indeed, uh, your 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 it shows like they're already up to thirty percent. In Singapore, it's even a little bit higher. I understood for my colleagues in, in Singapore at the moment. So there is hope. Um, what, one question: Do you know of anything? And maybe one of the other panelists can answer that question um, uh, if you don't know the answer. When these hotels reopened in China, did they open as they were before the crisis, or have there been modifications made? Um, for instance, has there been safe? measures being put in place or have any changes been uh, been uh, 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 been put in place I, I don't not being on the ground in china it might be something that one of our brand colleagues may be able to uh just shed a little yeah, bit that more would light be on interesting that. maybe luke you have quite a few hotels in in china uh, do you know of any changes that have been made so first of all, um, there was some, um, um, good morning everyone, so I'm very pleased to be with you today. <clears throat> it's true that uh, when we reopened hotels in China, first of all, they reopened as quickly as they closed, so, which was very interesting. We have over 90% of the network, which is uh, reopened, and it's very encouraging. The key element of, uh, of, uh, of business to start again was actually through FNB. So the main driver of dragging people back into hotels was essentially the FNB outlets, restaurants and bars, and then um, uh, hotels started to pick up from there. But what has changed, obviously, is the protocol of welcome and service, because obviously you still have to take all, all the um, uh, protective measures that uh, go around. Um, that, that we we did see across uh, particularly China during the the lockdown period, which was obviously quite long in a, a number of cities. Actually, the hotels um, utilised F and B uh, quite smartly in some cases as a way to maintain a revenue stream by offering delivery services, uh, which we obviously hadn't seen before. You know, hotels do not offer that as standard, but that did seem to be a way that. Um, some revenue streams could be maintained during the lockdown, um, which was interesting to see that that uh, adoption of, of, uh, of It's interesting new. that that F and B would be the main driver because I've, I'm, I'm obviously following quite a few discussions uh, from my position as CEO of Colliers in the Netherlands. Um, how will 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 all the when when the lockdown is being lifted in many countries? How will restaurants uh, uh, deal with the one and a half meter policy? Because if you're working in a kitchen or you have a, a restaurant that has a long shape, which many restaurants have, how would you be able to open that? Would it be, is it business as usual again? How does that work? Or is it restricted tables? Is there more space between the tables? Anybody can answer that question? Actually, I think we can, we can take, for example, um, the announcement that Czech Republic one of the first countries in Eastern Europe to announce an ease on, on the protocols. And uh, they announced the fact that uh, hotels and restaurants will be opening in June, on 8th of June. But they announced that first, 
the outside areas of the restaurant will be open to public and not the, and not the, out, the inside of the restaurant. So first of all, open air um, spaces will be used. And that, in, in my view, is one of the aspects that uh, um, bring this distanciation and this new service of protocol that needs to put in place. Okay. Interesting. Anyway, so let's um, let's let's focus. Let's switch the subject. Uh, this was a, a prelude to a whole discussion, but these questions are indeed very interesting to to understand, because once the crisis is over, how will hotels resume? Um, what recovery scenarios are there? Um, is is something we're going to touch on in a minute? Um, but let, let's first make a round. Uh, Takuya uh, with Hyatt, how are you dealing? with the closure of all the hotels um, in, and the, 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 the detailed question there is a bit open how are you dealing with fixed cost what is your, your strategy to um, um, to get out of the crisis to be prepared during lockdown how to get out of the crisis again what yeah, is your I main think, focus uh, you know we are not doing anything differently from others uh, uh, big I mean, great majority of hotels are, have closed uh, with some Chinese hotels I mean, being open now. Um, so far, I think the, the focus of the company was to keep the team in place as much as possible uh, so that when the recovery comes, then we'll have, we can rely on those people uh, to start working again. And obviously, their, their safety was also one of the big issues. Uh, we have the company has just announced a, a help fund to, to to really hand out money to those those associates who are in dire need. So uh, it, it has been very much people focused approach, uh, uh, and obviously, you know, depending on the jurisdiction, some people have been sent out sent on the furlough uh, on a different degree. Some are, you know, like in Russia, I think they they are to you know unpaid leave. Uh, a place like Switzerland, we we, we do get uh, government support. Any anybody any any other um, 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 systems that you've put in place, uh, Luke? How are you dealing with it? For closure of attempts? Yeah. So, um, so first of all, it is the constant. So we had things that we are used to and, and we like to do. So we, we've done this and, and populations that we have, which is owner and the client and the team. So that was very important to us. Um, what we are doing now, because that's already uh, done, you know, some of the hotels have actually closed. We are monitoring uh, very closely all the governmental um, uh, decisions to see when we can start and, and have a, an ability to reopen hotels. But for this as well, we are rewriting the procedures because obviously, as I said before, uh, we will certainly not be able to operate our hotels and restaurants in the same way that we have been before this crisis. There will be some due diligence and some, some safety protocols that we need to put in place to protect mm -hmm. all the- all But what kind of safety pro protocols are, are you thinking about, thinking of? So first of all, um, and I'll, I'll give a check-in <clears throat> at hotels. You know that in, in, we've been uh, very uh, innovative in hotels and, and, and we, we created this, uh, this uh, mobile check-in. So that means that we are in the hotel. But the proximity that we created there will have to be addressed if we want to keep this one or two meter um, uh, distanciation between people. So yeah. we have to rewrite the protocols of welcome. Yeah. The, the, I have a question here coming from the public, uh, that, that from, from the viewers, uh, relating to that. What about staff training and coping with each department, uh, reception, restaurants, wellness? How do you develop trainings in new situations? Are there new protocols? Absolutely. We are rewriting, as I said, we are rewriting service and welcome protocols. And we are in the process of doing e-learnings because we, we kept our, uh, our staff and team and talents on board. And uh, this is the right moment to actually train them on these new uh, service and welcome protocols. Yeah. 
whilst they are waiting for them to reopen. Yeah. Excellent, because I would imagine indeed and that this is obviously very difficult and from country to country it will be, will be different, is maintaining uh, and, and keeping your staff on board, looking after your staff, is probably one of the most important things. Uh, the moment you, uh, you have to reopen, they have to be ready for you. Uh, Hilko, how are you at ISG dealing with that? Well, it, it, as you said correctly, and, and following a bit what Luke said, no, it, it differs very much from country per country. Uh, but but we we have uh, uh, normally we have a hotel openings team that helps us, you know, which is which is separate from our technical and operational team that helps in all the hotel openings, which has been extremely helpful in in actually closing the hotels uh, successfully, switching off, as you know. Uh, a, a light bulb or a light switch systems with the staff, with the phasing. We had a lot of reservations still on the books. All of that has to be addressed. And then there's obviously a lot of legal aspects that need to be reviewed. And now that most of the hotels are closed, and as I said, there is still quite a lot of hotels also open, depending on the country, because we're, you know, we have several hotels in, in Spain and Madrid that are still open, that are catering to, to doctors and nurses to, to stay over, that cannot go home. The same in Belgrade, the same, a lot of them also in the UK with, with uh, um, you know, with homeless people, with people that, that need temporary shelter. Um, we've started also all of these uh, in quite a lot of hotels that are still somewhat running these F&B programs. So with, you know, catering to outside, at least to keep the cash flow coming in. And then this hotel openings team, now that most of the hotels that really needed to close have closed, they're now starting to prep together with the operational teams on how are we going to open all of this together with, you know, the, I mean, nobody really has a crystal ball. So it is really a bit of a reactive on, on because no, you know, at the beginning, I think everybody thought this was going to be a lockdown for two weeks. And that's obviously changing. Um, and one of the big things we're doing is, is talking to owners, GMs um, and managers on a basically daily basis through our ops and franchise ops and management ops and commercial teams. Um, to understand their situation and plan for it from there on. Yeah, I can, I can imagine. Um, Takuya, is anything you have to add on, on this one? Is Hyatt doing anything different or is it all the same? I think it's the same. I mean, we are, we are working on a new checking procedure. We are thinking that there will be more usage of, on, you know, uh, how do you call it, uh, mobile checking, uh, but, you know, Things like how we're going to serve breakfast, especially if you're in a luxury segment, uh, you know, those things still we haven't figured out. I think we're just at the initial stage of, of operational planning for post uh, COVID yeah. Uh, world. Yeah, it's. I guess we we no, none of us has a, have a crystal ball, and uh, it's it's going to have to have to be learning by by experience, I guess. Um, but we do we do have a little bit of experience already in China. Um, Thomas, if I ask you, are there any numbers uh, available where you see once um, um, hotels are picking up? Is there anything that we can learn from? Are, for instance, uh, as you mentioned also in your presentation, is our mid-scale hotels uh, accelerating first and the luxury follows? Or is there any speed that we can predict and, and, and what we can learn from in China, but may, what, what may happen in, in the CEE region? Anything that the numbers can, can tell us? Something predictive? Um, it's, a, it's a great question. I mean, what, we, what we've seen in China is, yes, <laughs> indeed, um, is the pickup of, of, yes, the, the, the mid-scale and economy a bit, a bit faster. I think, um, I, I think what, we, what we're expecting, and I think you can probably apply this regardless of, of destination, is that initially a recovery will come from a demand perspective from the, from the leisure uh, that strong domestic demand so market like Sanya is doing you know quite well uh, in China for example so I think if we're going to have that pent up demand of people when they can travel they are going to want to um, and they're going to want to to quickly um, if of course they feel they're safe that you know there, there is obviously the, the 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 ongoing concerns around around the virus um and it will depend 
on borders, of course, as well in Central and Eastern Europe, which isn't such a, a challenge for, for, for China because it is so domestic driven. So I think the, the challenge for Central and Eastern Europe, if I look at it, is it's such an international destination. Um, yes, there are some very strong leisure markets, of course, you know, from a city perspective, Prague or Budapest or, uh, you know, the Croatian coastline, for example. Um, but that will require international visitation, which will require that level of comfort around where the virus is at. And also governments to, to say that borders are open and people are, are able to travel. Um, so if, if, if it's quite difficult to compare uh, China because of, of the size of, of the destination, um, but also that, that domestic um, demand. But I think leisure will be key and then how corporate and uh, transient follows and corporate group um, post that, of course, remains to be seen. There. No, I would, um, can I? Yeah, go ahead. Can go I ahead. add something? Yeah, um, I agree that, that I can agree with what Thomas said. Uh, and you know, I just wanted to know to even within different CE countries, there are, there's there are significant differences. For instance, you know, take Romania. Uh, basically, about eighty percent of accommodation demand is local. Uh, and if you look at coastal, uh, so long as there is an easy, you know, lifting of some sort of restriction and that, that some sort of sense of normality comes back. I think these are these are places that can get back quickly. Whereas if you have to look at Croatia, where the, the, the you know, basically tourism demand is 90% dependent yeah. on foreign market, you know, they somehow lose ability to control. I mean, they are, the, whether they can get back to business will depend on feeder markets such as, you yeah. know, UK, Germany, Italy. That you know that so I just want to give us straight that within the region there will be a difference. I think country like Poland, Ukraine, uh, Russia will probably act like Romania because there will be pent up domestic demand. Yeah, yeah, that's I I, I, I tend to completely agree with you. Um, <clears throat> that brings me also to to uh, to to a next topic. Owners are obviously hurting uh, big time. Um, Croatia, you just mentioned it, is, is highly dependent on, on, on tourism. The whole coastline of Croatia uh, depends on, uh, indeed, on, on mostly on, on, on foreign uh, visitors, international travelers. Airlift is big time hurt by this crisis. Um, logically, we could probably assume that the summer season uh, hotels will not reopen, and if they would reopen, then still, how are people going to travel or are people going to stay in their own country? So uh, we focus on Croatia a, a minute, but also on the Serbian coast or the Montenegrin coast. Um, are these hotel owners in trouble? Uh, let's switch to you. No, sir. Uh, here. I think it's one of your favorite topics anyway. But you, you can, but uh, first of all, I believe we will not commercialize our hotels the way we did in the past. Let's face it, before this crisis, for the past two or three years in Central and Eastern Europe, we were in a maximization situation. That means that we could uh, be fussy and decide who was coming in and at what price. Because the market was such, the quality of the hotels was such, and, and, and we were in a very strong uh, position there. Now, today, tomorrow, when we reopen, we need to think about it totally differently because our owners, as you said, are in difficulty now. And what we need to do now is generate some cash flow. Our owners, uh, other than performance, before we were looking at our RGI and how we compare with the competition and so on, their main focus right now is cash flow. How can I sustain my debt management? So this is. First of all, the first thing that we need to integrate in our mind as service operator uh, in, in, in terms of commercialization of the hotels. Secondly, it's business that actually depends on leisure market. Uh, uh, you can, on the North Coast, you can take Krakow. There is many cities 
like this. So it's, it's not so much a specific area. Everyone depends on, on the leisure season because that generally, but we don't know how. And no one knows how we are going to sell. We can only extrapolate based on what China did. But once again, we, we, we have to understand that our hotel is in Central and Eastern Europe depends on 80% of, of European flows. What? And, and, and yeah. on European flows. So that means inter-European countries uh, uh, feed our market. <clears throat> so definitely, if we have to tackle domestic market, it's a whole new dimension that we need to bring into, into the commercialization of the hotels. So I think the cash flow of our owners is at risk because unfortunately, we don't know how far this crisis is gonna go. Everyone started to talk about reopening hotels and so on because we need economy to go, but that's an defeated. So we still need to be careful and need to adapt the way we're gonna behave as consumer. And that needs to be integrated as well into how we're gonna generate cash flow for the owners. So the, the, um, I, I have a question from Mark Gozens, who is in the, the, uh, in, the, in, the, in the audience, which is a good point, I guess, and something that we could, uh, we could uh, transpose to the, to the panel. Uh, in Germany, social distancing will take a long time. He's written it in Dutch, so I'm, try I'm, uh, <laughs> I'm translating it live. But, so citizen, uh, basically hotels like Citizen M and Price Hotel, they don't require any human contact, really. If you walk through the door, you have terminals where you can, uh, Aloft has the same thing. You have terminals where you can type in, you can walk to your room without any, really you don't need any human contact. Is that the future of hotels? Takuya? Hilko? Yes, I know. I mean, if you look, sorry, go ahead, Takuya. <laughs> Takuya, you first. <laughs> I think in a budget to, uh, you know, okay, there'll be more use of technology, definitely. And probably that will be more pronounced in a budget economy, how, whatever you call it, select service. Uh, uh, how you will do the similar thing at the luxury level without really screwing up the customer <laughs> no. experience. I don't know. I know, but this, this could be an answer to uh, which hotels will be opening first, like we were discussing with Thomas a little bit earlier. Yuko, what is your thought? I mean, certain hotels, you know, they're easier to do, and we're already starting to do it, you know, in our expresses, you know, where you you, you have a bit the same. But, but yeah, I agree. I mean, there there is a moment where I think people need that service, that connectivity, and, and I think on, by nature, people tend to forget relatively quickly. I mean, this is obviously a, a, a you know, a central redefining moment, find the cure, you know, people tend to forget relatively quickly and, and move on. So, I mean, there's no crystal ball, but I, I think definitely there will be more technology. But in the I tend to say, no. I'm, 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 well, I want sure. to share something here because obviously I guess experience is a really important uh, matter and close to my heart. Of course, the digitalization in our industry has been uh, uh, um, very strong and developing a lot. And yes, digitalization is necessary and will be there in the future. But what this crisis is showing us as well, if you look at the beginning of the confinement, everybody was so thrilled about being able to do everything online. Right now, after one month, we already start to think I'm missing the human contact. I'm giving you another month before you start to say, and I think this is what we need to integrate, our clients will want to have more quality human time. And hoteliers, other than a good bedroom, a good breakfast and a nice check-in, we're gonna have to think about that because we're gonna have a responsibility in how the people want to actually experience their quality time now. Well, I would agree, but then again, as, as all of you uh, online here have under your own flag, you have multiple brands. So you basically have experience on demand already in your portfolios. So um, perhaps this will, will, will this crisis lead to some more consolidation and some more deep digging on, on, uh, on getting rid of some of the brands where I sometimes think, certainly when we, Merit is not online, but Merit has got what? 34 brands or something like that now. Um, are they going to survive? Uh -huh. 
Well, thank God we don't have that many brands, so we're, we're still quite core. Um, you know, we, we focused on, on, on what we have and then really made that stronger. But I think, yeah, inevitably there will be some level of consolidation. And, and looking also, not maybe as much in Eastern Europe, but also from a Southern European perspective, there's a ton, you know, lease is the predominant business model. And, and there's a lot of smaller, medium, and even larger hotel companies that are going through the lease with the lease model that are getting all their lease guarantees, corporate lease guarantees called all at the same time. And that's obviously, you know, a huge issue. And that's definitely going to have an effect moving forward. I'm not saying that that means that there's going to be consolidation and the big guys are going to be snapping up the others because obviously liquidity and, and, and the cash is, is it's, it's a big concern for everybody. Uh, but, but there's definitely, but you're touching on the, I, I definitely see quite a bit moving, uh, leaving quite a lot of brands disappearing, but I would think more, Towards the, 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 the mid level. You're touching on an interesting subject, the leases. In, in, in Holland and in Germany, there's a lot of institutional companies that have a lot, of, a lot of money in the bank, so they can survive the crisis. But smaller ones who have, have leases and are not getting paid right now, um, they should be in big trouble. So do, can, we, can we forecast and can we anticipate to more management agreements, more sharing of revenues uh, going forward, coming out of this crisis? Um, Thomas, what do you think? You, you can have an opinion on that one, I think. Uh, um, I, I actually, I, I think, uh, you know, this isn't something that I, I particularly look at. So I actually think you, you'd be better off asking one of the, the brand uh, guys, I'm afraid. Sorry to give that political you, answer. It's, but, it's, not uh, your, it's not your brief, I understand that. Um, what, what do you think on this? Let's let's switch to Luke. Luke, what do you think? Is are, are a lot of smaller leases are they going to disappear? Will you see more management agreements or franchise agreements? Um, I think a lot of um, um, hotel owners will be uh, will be in the difficulty <clears throat> in the difficulty because um, in the past, as I said, we were used to have a very strong demand, a very strong market. Now. Um, they, they're going to need to very fast recover some kind of cash flow. I think the service operator can actually, if we reform the way we approach the business as well, because in the past we were also very selective <coughs> about with whom we, we work with, if suddenly we reform a little bit the way we approach the, the added value of our services, and rather to, to propose a bundle of belonging or not to a network, but suddenly if we start to slice a little bit the added value services that we have, just for the owners to benefit from certain services and not all of them, if not necessary, I think that suddenly we can find a new way of, of cooperations on the market that would um, make us much more responsible for, for what we drive as a destination. So I think that um, there is an opportunity for owner, in the, uh, I would say independent owner, to actually get from a uh, service operator the best of their added value uh, without having to take everything. And then for us, an ability also to drive um, um, a higher amount of fees, of course, uh, by getting new corporations yeah. on the market, yes. Um, Takuya, um, you mentioned uh, Romania earlier, where there's a lot of uh, unbranded hotels and privately owned hotels. Um, Obviously, as, 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 as you're all re representing uh, the serious brands, there's a lot of advantage that you can bring to, to independent owners at the moment. If you just think of procurement or your sharing experiences, do you see opportunities going forward? Are you already looking at that um, uh, to approach uh, um, uh, owners with independent hotels, approaching them with your experience and help? I think, obviously, I'm sure all of us are uh, thinking about it. Uh, for you know, post-COVID world, a question is how we're going to do it, and uh, whether we have money to make make that happen. I think one thing that that you know, I see all this chat and questions coming. One thing that we will we'll probably have to address is rebalancing of risks between the operators or brands and the owners. Uh, and we, we ourselves have you know, realized that our, our business is so much dependent on ownership. Uh, and and I, we do need the support, but also I think, you know, I think the current crisis has shown that this, this model is, is, it needs to be addressed. Yeah. Uh, Hilko, what is your opinion? 
Do you agree uh, with you, Cleo? I think it's too early day to really think. I mean, obviously it's being thought about and then and, and people are working on it. I think it's too early day to really think, okay, how are you going to go to all these individual owners and, and give them added value? Because every fight advanced is, is with a help pack uh, for existing owners. Obviously, we're already helping them, but some of them have uh, unbranded properties. So we're, we're preparing special offers from a commercial and operations perspective that we can offer existing owners that already know our systems and, and get those unbranded properties they have into mm -hmm. IHG brands. Luke, what is your view? Well, Serious talk. Uh, as I said, I think that uh, <clears throat> service operators have, have a very strong added value. And I think if we are able to bring it in way, we, we can actually have a better cooperation. I understand, I understand, I agree with, uh, with Takuya on, on the risk uh, uh, split, because, because today there is a strong dependency between service operator and owner, and, and we, need to be, uh, we need to be reviewing this, in my view, uh, to make sure that we are bo both, um, um, as a partnership, uh, safe in this matter. So um, this is all obviously assuming, um, look, the, the, with all these hotels closed, and, and if you look at some of your, um, uh, some of you have different positions. I mean, Accor has very strong financial partners. Marriott has, uh, has, a, has an incredible debt, how much billion? Um, would it be feasible that there will be split ups, that, that, that there will be a different landscape? Would you would you think that um is laughing? <laughs> Don't that's yes. not very nice. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> would it be feasible that that um, that that some of you will join forces and 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 really indeed rethink a different model? Um, similarly, I'm thinking on the backdrop of 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 the enormous rise of Airbnb that we've seen, and um, will that be able to survive or Will there be a possibility to brand, to use Airbnb, take it over and brand it? Would that be an advantage? Would that anybody an opinion on this? Because if this crisis lasts another three, four, five months, then this year would be basically a write-off, wouldn't it? So how does that, how, how are you all getting out of the crisis? Let's say this lasts until the end of the year. What, um, what would be the scenario then? Ilko? You want to kick off on this one? It's an easy one for you. It's an, uh, yeah, it's a complicated <laughs> one. Uh, 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 it is. It's, uh, it's, it's a really the answer scenario, for us. I mean, but, but we have to go down to basics here a bit again. You know, so as soon as we can start that we see that demand is coming up and, and this is obviously a rolling ball. We initially thought that, you know, speaking to our Italian owners at the end of April, was an opening possibility of them. I think in the end, it all comes down to the basics. Once the demand and the, and the economy start loosening up a bit, we're just going to have to start and, and just take it day by day from there. I don't think there, there's obviously a, probably at a corporate level, there's a lot more planning on, you know, how the future is going to look and, and, and is there how the consolidation and all of that, but from an operational and really just starting, it's it's down to basics and just getting these hotels open, I think is going to be one of the biggest tasks and, and main priorities, but then also obviously, how are you going to service them from a commercial uh, perspective and I'll, from a system delivery? Then, that's, then, then let's let's stay on this track. Uh, Takui, I'm switching over to you. Um, will it be feasible that, that a lot of hotels will not reopen at all anymore? What is your opinion on that? I think it depends. It really depends. Uh, uh, you know, there will obviously a pressure to reopen, but um, you know, I think we need to make a commercial decision as to whether the cost associated with reopening will be compensated or more than compensated for by the potential revenue. Uh, I think uh, you know it's too early to say, but but uh, but. What I what I think that can happen is some of the hotels which needed, let's say, renovation, and if the owner has money, probably this is a good time to do it. So, in the same line, look, 
um, if you look at um, a country like Croatia, let's let's go. I'm seeing Marina in the screen, so let's uh, that makes me think of Croatia. Um, the coastline there, the enormous dependency of of the G, of the Croatian GDP on tourism. I believe it's it's anywhere between twenty and thirty percent even. Um, would we, you expect something from central or local governments to come up with aid or, or, or to facilitate reopening of hotels? Would that be something that would be feasible or necessary? <clears throat> so I, I wouldn't focus specifically on Croatia on that matter. Oh, that's just, as said, just an example. As I said, many destinations would actually uh, uh, be in difficulties. Um, yes, of course, I, 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 I would expect expect that this industry is supported because um, we know that it actually brings um, uh, a lot to each country's GDP and and employment in the countries is really important in that industry so governments will have to support it because um, first of all this is what actually drive additional economy you know we are not an independent uh, or standalone economy you know or, or industry um, we 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 we, we we link and we clicked with other industries. So if we don't function, a lot of other industries affect. So obviously they need to suspect, sustain um, and most definitely in, in the leisure and seasonality uh, uh, destination like uh, Croatia. So they already do. There is some uh, um, uh, employment support uh, for the time being, but uh, if that crisis was to last longer, they would have to support uh, hotel owners in, in a different way and in a stronger way. I know that th some of the countries are actually preparing plans for this to support uh, hotel owners uh, in the way to sustain the longevity of the crisis. Um, for instance, um, uh, in, in, in Poland, there are support and also um, uh, plans to, to sustain and to incentivize families to use uh, the, the, the domestic destination. So, Yes, I, I would expect it uh, for the sake of owner survival and, and cash flow uh, protection, but I think it's being prepared as well. Now, answering your question earlier about what would happen in the scenario if we were to go in a crisis towards the end of the year, I don't think we actually have no. an answer to this. Because if that was the, if that was the case, <clears throat> it is not a question of hotel or hospitality industry no. survival. It's it's the global economic situation we would have to face. I yeah, think. but it, it's 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 I, I I guess it's safe to assume that there will be some permanent changes after this crisis is over, whether it's just after the summer or it's it's even a little bit longer, um, which has to do with, with sanitation and and with 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 health uh, issues in order to reopen. Um, but it's 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 clear that it has a um, a very serious impact, obviously, on everybody's cash position, and uh, it's draining because, and certainly in the hotel industry, where you have an an, an international um, uh, policy, really, you work in in so many countries, and all the the policies of all each country is different, and um, so it's it's probably in, indeed difficult to assume. Um, what to do, where, and, and when. Countries like uh, Poland and Warsaw are highly dependent on business, business travel. Do you expect business travel to change after this crisis uh, versus leisure? Um, Ilko, you? Uh, yes, for sure. I mean, right. I think there's, there's going to be, as we've mentioned before, there's going to be more dependence. I think a lot of companies are going to be looking also at the need for, the real need for travel. Uh, I think the, the fact that you obviously have the, the contact and the closeness issue, that's going to have a, a, at least a short and midterm effect on the mice industry, the big conferences and everything, that's all going to be reviewed in more detail. So that's definitely going to have an impact. And I, I would dare to suffer more, more than the urban. It's probably the urban that's, that's the sector that's going to recover first, because obviously with connectivity and that's where the, in the end the business is probably going to drive the first tranche of, 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 of you know of business that's coming back um, so I think yeah definitely there's going to be changes uh, for the we live future on, on how we travel mainly on the business right we, we live in an experienced economy and at least we did before the uh, before the crisis um, will that experience economy 
um, accelerate with where we, there was a lot of awareness uh, before the crisis on sustainability, a lot of focus on, <laughs> on sustainability. Is this crisis, if, in terms of never waste a good crisis, is this crisis an opportunity to focus more on sustainability? Will that become a, a more important um, issue going forward, Kuya? Yeah, I think before going to that, our business will be driven by money and uh, even us, ourselves, I think our ability to travel will be heavily scrutinized under, you know, under control. Uh, when it comes to non-business travel, I, I, you know, I, I think we don't know how people are going to react. I think all of us have realized that those places we have always wanted to go or those people we have always wanted to see may suddenly become unreachable tomorrow, right? So there is a sort of sense of urgency. Uh, and I think that will also play a role in people's decisions. Uh, in terms of sustainability, I think it will not stop. It is going to be here. I think you know this crisis has shown that um, we can't just continue to build more and more hotels and resorts. We know those things are so vulnerable. All of them can, can come to stop. Can, you know, can, can come to a halt overnight. So there has to be a more responsible policy uh, around this. And also, you know, I think what, what we have learned is that the, as an industry, we are not, how say, we are, we are not, we should be able to, to support the public sector more in the time of need. Also facilitators. <laughs> Can I jump in just Do you have when, anything uh, to add to, to, to Koya's wise words? What is that, Marina? Well, I just wanted to add one question, if I, if I may. Uh, concerning uh, asset management, have you or any of you received any uh, requests or proposals from owners to change the concept of the hotel? Because it seems that the office sector is going to be influenced uh, now as well more offices or more companies will be looking for a uh, co-working space. So did you have any interest from the owners to maybe change some parts of the hotel and move them to co-working just in order to gain more business that is on site, that is in their city, local, instead of just waiting for new guests to come? Is the question directed at someone? Well, it, in all the operas, so maybe we can start with Luke and Hilko and Takuya. I, know the, the, I, I wouldn't say that uh, the crisis is actually driving, driving this, uh, this change, but we already had, uh, before crisis, a asset management maximization uh, policy, whereas every square meter needs to be um, generating uh, at least revenue and or profit for the owner. So the co-working or uh, any new services or any new um, revenue levers that we could use per square meter, we were already exploring this. Now, what we see, however, is, uh, is uh, some owners who actually were on a um, wanted to be more secure and more um, uh, um, uh, taken through, changing from business model from franchise to manage. Yes, we see that uh, type of things. But on, um, we're not getting so much of a, of a change in that aspect. Obviously, we are seizing opportunities because, um, for example, we launch uh, occupancy because of the crisis of the bedroom is not optimum, uh, we use and we have a platform to uh, rent bedroom as offices for eight hours a day um, as an additional revenue. So all these kind of um, additional revenue uh, streams we already uh, implemented, yes. Okay. So Marina, does that answer your question? No, no yes. just, I think there's also another way to look at it. It's, it's that because obviously now I think also, a lot of corporate office buildings are going to be reevaluated re because, uh, you know, bigger corporations are going to have a serious look at the amount of people they can have, you know, a big office building uh, in, in, in the big cities. 
quickly. So I think a lot of office space might come up also for, for grabs at some time. So there's also the, uh, an opportunity also during the crisis of, you know, of, of uh, the mid 2000, 2012 and everything. There was quite a lot of opportunities also, for example, in Holland, where ho offices got converted to hotels. Indeed, I am I'm very much aware of that. The <laughs> I know you are. Collier just came out with a with a report last week on um, in, in in the Netherlands. Um, there's two million square meters of office space in the Netherlands, and once we go back to work, and we're respect will only be uh, eight hundred thousand square meters be, will be of use. The one point two million cannot be used. And, and as as we calculated here, so I doubt whether hotel, whether offices will be. Uh, we need people can work. No, concluding, I think it's uh, we've had our hour. Um, I don't see any burning questions from um, uh, from uh, the audience uh, on on screen, others than that most of them we've 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 covered. Um, any last words from you, Luke? Oh, and I would tend to say that uh, we need to remain positive because um, um, e even though um, the situation right now doesn't look that uh, great, I think it's really important that uh, we, we continue to strive towards uh, coming out of this crisis and we keep with the essential of our job. Our job is to welcome people and give them a good time. I know right now it sounds out of the blue and where is this coming from? But as you said, we are a business of hospitality, welcome, smile, warmth. And those people, our guests, they're going to need this. And we're going to have to be ready for that. If we reopen our hotels with a sad face saying, oh my God, we cannot have this. No, we have to be celebrating yeah. the reopening. And that's really important because I know that right now it's difficult to have this state of mind, but we're going to have to have this because the hospitality industry has always been a fighting industry. And we need to keep that state of mind. I could not agree more with you. Yuko, any last words from you? I agree with Luke. We have to stay positive. I mean, the world has gone through, you know, crisis after crisis for, for, for centuries and the world has always progressed and we'll, we'll find a way out of this as well. And I'm sure we're going to come out stronger and hopefully better prepared. Takuya, your wisdom? Yeah, I agree. I mean, this industry has always been around no matter what happened. And I think good thing that, came, that is coming out of this crisis, we'll, we are learning to Agreed. appreciate each other more. Thomas, any, any last words from I, you? I concur with what the, the other gentlemen have said. The, the industry will come back. Uh, we don't know how long it will take, but it will come back. And, uh, you know, let's be positive and not re and remember. Yeah, I agree as well, obviously, with everybody. Uh, but also, I'd like to make a note that we're talking about a virus. There are um, the last, last news, I thought, but I was reading in the newspaper yesterday, there is about... 90 different laborat laboratoria are working on an antivirus and uh, I'm sure the antivirus will be found at some point. Um, whether that's the last virus we'll have to fight in this industry remains to be seen. The COVID-19 we've had, maybe COVID-20 and 21 are already in the waiting room, but for sure um, it, it, th that part of science will change everything and I agree. Let's hope we get out of this and uh, I wish everybody very well and I thank my panel uh, for a wonderful discussion. Um, I hope you're all keeping well and uh, are still able to enjoy a little bit of, of sunlight um, in this upcoming uh, springtime. And let's hope for the best and make sure that uh, uh, we all stay safe. Thank you. Thank you very, very much thank to you. all of you. Thank, thank you, Dave. Thank, thank you, Marina. Thanks, Marina. Bye-bye. Uh, yeah. Bye now. Bye. Bye. For all of those that are still here, I just want to say thank you once again. And I would like to uh, tell you that our next webinar is going to be in 14 days on the 29th of April with investors. So join us then as well. We'll keep you posted about the, uh, the webinar date, the time, the link to register, and all other details. Thank you so much for being with us here.